Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today we're joined by Doug, who's the founder of the Peacock's Only Facebook group and a, a very experienced Peacock owner, and um, he's here to share a little bit more of his knowledge with us. We uh, recorded an episode a few months back, so if you're interested in Peacock, I definitely recommend looking at that one. Um, but today we're going to narrow it down and focus a little bit more, and, and so Doug, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me on, and uh, and thank you for letting me talk about my favorite subject, peacocks. Absolutely. You're such a wealth of knowledge, and, and you know, peafowl are not quite as easy as chickens, so uh, it certainly is helpful for uh, anybody that has peafowl to be able to pick your brain and get some of your knowledge so that our birds can be happy and healthy and thrive. Yeah, you know, chickens, uh, they, they thrive with very little care, and they're resistant to more of the diseases. So you have to keep a little better eye on peacocks. Yep, yep. Their uh, their work comes with their beauty, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I I want to talk to people about preparing for the laying season. You know, the preparation actually starts in January. And what you need to do is you need to worm your birds, give them a worm medication. And whatever worm medication you use, just about any of them is good, except for wazine. Don't use wazine. It's the oldest thing on the shelf and it's the poorest quality and it's the least effective and you're just not going to get good results with it. So whatever else you use, 10 to 12 days later, you want to give them another dose. Some give it in the water, some give it directly down the beak, but you give them the second dose because they have laid eggs. And since the first dose, the eggs have hatched and you have a batch of new young larvae. So you want to be able to kill that that second batch and uh, get those worms under control. And why do we want to worm the birds in January? What's the reason for that? Well, there's a couple of good reasons. You know, they cause the roundworms will cause intestinal damage, and they'll actually go in there. And one of the one of the ways you detect that uh, the symptoms of uh, of roundworms is that blood starts passing out in the poop. So they get in there and they they just uh, they they do bad. It's bad damage. There's another one called a sequel worm, which in and of itself is not. The, the worst thing about or the worm damage, they have a parasite on them, which is a protozoan. And the more common name for it is blackhead. And, and actually the head of, of the bird never turns black. I think we just like to say it for the shock value, blackhead. You know, it just sounds so awesome because it really is a deadly disease. Those protozoans get in and multiply. They're carried in by the worms. And you'll see the symptom of those is yellow in the poop. So you'll know when you've got those. And the way you treat those, the coccidiosis and the blackhead, is to go ask your vet for five tablets, 250 milligrams of metronidazole. You have one tablet a day for five days and it'll knock it out. But, you know, you want to give some worm medicine too along with that. Okay. So the worming then helps them to produce eggs or just to help their general health before they go into the laying season? It's going to keep them healthy. It really is. And you want to get them on a good laying pellet uh, at least a month before you expect the first egg. Now, we're all pretty much going to get eggs by April 1st, but you know that they, they, uh, they can come in March, and some of them in different parts of the country is a different time for laying. And so you want to get them on a, lay, uh, a chicken laying pellet, w- which is a complete diet. You want to get them on that a, a month before you get the first egg, Okay and worm your birds a month ahead of time, and then you can go into the season and worry in much better health. But I want to talk about collecting and storing the eggs. Okay. A peacock is going to lay um, pretty close to nighttime. Now, you'll get eggs in the late afternoon and daytime, but you, you're going to get them all. If they're going to lay, you're going to get them all right at dark. And it's pretty predictable where they lay. They all lay pretty much in the same places. Now, people ask me all the time, well, what, I, what kind of nest box do I make? And we all make nest boxes, but the, the peacocks, they just uh, so often don't, don't use them. They scrape out a little bowl-shaped place on the ground, and that's where they lay, or they lay right on top of the ground. 
And I put some platforms up in my, my barn in the corner, three, four foot off the ground. Mm-hmm. They jump up there and they'll lay in that. The favorite place to lay is on top of the coops. So <laughs> they lay just about everywhere and you have to look everywhere. But you get those eggs and you collect them and just before dark and don't put them in the refrigerator. You can set them out on the counter for one, two, three days time. But if it's cold weather and the egg is cold, you need to let that egg warm up to room temperature before you put them in the incubator. Don't, don't go out there and pick up an egg that's 40 degrees and throw it in an incubator that's got 99.5 degrees. So, sure. it's, it's, so you just want to let them warm up to room temperature and put them in. And, and if they're dirty, you can just wash them with soap and water and warm water and, and, and wash them off. A lot of people think that an egg has some kind of magic film around it that protects it from bacteria that's you don't you don't wash them and you don't need to do this or do that but uh that's it, just not true that that egg comes out of there coated with all kinds of bacteria if the egg uh has got poop on it or it's got mud on it or something else you need to wash that off sure now i i have a friend that um has been raising peafowl for a long time and occasionally he'll give me some eggs to incubate and he said that his hen lays what he calls dummy eggs, that they're like unfertilized eggs that she lays away from the nest to detract predators. Is there any truth to that? Or is that maybe like an old wives' tale? It may work out that way, but the hen cannot control the fertility of the egg. And the hen's not going to know if the egg is fertile or not. So if you've got some early season eggs, you know, in the early part of the season, you're going to get some that are not fertile. It may have worked out that way, but it, it's not a regular part of, of uh, sure. what people want to peacock does. That makes sense. Uh-huh. Eggs are difficult to incubate, peacock eggs. They're not like chicken eggs. Chicken eggs, you can put them in an incubator. And if you have some fluctuation in the temperature or humidity, they'll go ahead and give you a pretty good decent hatch rate. But a peacock egg, you better get a good grip on the humidity at 60%. And the temperature, you, it needs to fluctuate between 99 and 100. And, uh, you're still going to get some disappointing results. If you get about 60, 65% of chicks to hatch for everything you pick up, uh, you're doing pretty good. And some are going to be infertile. Some are just going to go full term. And they're just simply not going to hatch. And we all deal with this problem every year. And we try to perfect the method, but it uh, doesn't seem like there's any magic. And why do you think that that is? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> you know, I tell people, Oh, boy, if I knew I, I could uh, really sell that idea. So they're, they're just difficult. To, and, and they're probably not the only egg that's difficult to hatch in an incubator because, uh, you know, when you get into other more exotic birds like cranes, expensive ducks, or, you know, other birds, they're probably equally not, not able to hatch as well. Sure. But the peacocks, you're going to have difficulty with them. and You need to keep a lot of hens on hand, and you need to have a lot of eggs. Now, if you got a chicken, you put them under that chicken, you're going to do a lot better with putting them under a chicken or a turkey because, you know, just a, an incubator is a poor substitute for sitting in. Mm-hmm. You'll do much better putting them under. And some people, I know one commercial guy, I, he, he says he hatches 1,200 chicks a year, peacocks, and he says he keeps a, uh, a flock of uh, silky bantams, which make the best sitters. <laughs> Mm-hmm. He keeps a flock of silky bantams and he puts them on, under there for about eight days and then puts them in the incubator. And he said that that really improves the, uh, the hatchery. How interesting. Just just one week of it. So hmm. it's much better if you have, they, they'll hatch in about 26, 28 days. So it's much better if you haven't set all on it. But even one week of it seems to improve the hatch. So if somebody is not fortunate enough to have a flock of silky moms, what's our incubation settings? Well, you're going to set that humidity on 60%, and uh, you're going to set the temperature on 99 to 100. Now, if you have an incubator, which is not forced draft, which means it doesn't have a fan to circulate the air, you have to increase the, uh, the temperature by at least, I think you have to run it 101. And there's all kinds of incubators out there, and so some, some are going to be more effective than others. What people try to get a hold of, the ones that do it commercially, they try to get a hold of a great big old one. Heavy duty redwoods that hold hundreds of eggs at one time. I don't know why somebody didn't make a good simple incubator anymore. I agree. They 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 resurrect those things and, and they use those. But I, I use a cabinet incubator and I, I 
putting in about, I think about 180 eggs uh, on three trays. And I, I get fairly decent results. I, I, I still struggle with it every year. And how many eggs do you usually set at a time? You know, on the startup, there's fewer eggs. And on the tail end, there's fewer eggs. And then there's the rush in the middle. Where you, so sometimes I have to run three incubators. Oh, my goodness. And Yeah. And um, I try to only hatch in one of them. But sometimes I, I plug them all up. Because, you know, I, I get about 700 eggs a year. And during that rush period, you know, if I... Because a hatcher is different from an incubator. A hatcher is. Mm -hmm. And so... I try not to uh, get over there in the hatcher, but uh, sometimes I got to fill up the hatcher too. The only difference between a hatcher and an incubator is usually the, the hatcher, the trays don't turn. They don't automatically rotate the eggs to, to substitute for turning, turning the eggs. You, know, you have to turn the eggs or else the embryo will get lopsided if you just lay in one position. And I know that you have some recommendations for after the, the chicks hatch once they're still in the incubator or the hatcher? You bet. Because uh, these uh, pea chicks, they're not like chickens, especially not like guineas. I had some guineas many years ago, and those suckers, they just jump up and they're ready to run. I mean, in 15 <laughs> minutes, they're all over the place. Yes, but, they are. Uh, a a pea chick is not like that. Uh, you need to leave them in that incubator after they completely hatch. You need to leave them in that incubator for three days. Now, people wonder about eating and drinking. But what some people don't realize is, that chick will not eat and drink for the first three days. So if you keep them in there for three days and they're not eating and they're not drinking, they're doing fine because, you know, the yolk is actually what the bird lives off of the first three days. Eventually, the, the yolk is all consumed by the chick. So you you leave them in there, and on that third day, if you've got a clear glass on the front of your incubator where you can see in there, Oh, buddy, you turn that light on, you'll come to the front pocket, peck it on the glass and let you know it's time to come out. <laughs> but they sometimes will need some assistance in hatching. And this is the trickiest part right here. They they want to poke a hole in the shell way too early. And so, you know, what, what is your first reaction? Well, let's, let's make that hole a little bigger and help this chick come out. But they do it prematurely. And if you do that, that chick is going to bleed out and die. That thing, that egg is full of blood. So you have to leave, if they poke a hole in it, you have, don't try to assist them for three days. On that third day, you can try to assist them. And get ready for curled toes. If you ever help a chick out of a, out an egg, you better get ready for the toes to be curled up. I, I wish I had a scientific explanation why, but it's going to happen. I'm going to send you a link, and you post it. And I have a four-minute video, a real simple process that tells you how to straighten out toes, splayed legs and crooked ankles it works like magic it's real simple to do yeah we'll post that link in the show notes and i know that i actually used that video for the pea chicks that i hatched out because sure enough they had curled toes uh -huh. it was not a complicated fix it's a little hard to hold on to them when they're so wiggly but it worked yeah. really well <laughs> and really quick yeah 12 hours and you're finished you know mm -hmm. now sometimes you put one out in the coop and somehow it's not quite, the foot doesn't look exactly like you want it to. Uh, you just take them and put them back in that, uh, do the treatment all over again. And uh, 12 hours, back in the incubator, if you have a cabinet incubator or an incubator that they'll fit in, 12 hours and then put them back out again. It's not going to hurt them at all. And some people say, you know, we have to put them in there and we have to straighten the toes out and tape them down. And they'll say, well, you know, that... Uh, that looks like torture. I said, you know what torture is? Torture is letting that bird go through life crippled up. You didn't do anything mm -hmm. about it. Absolutely. But that, that little box, I guess I've had right at 200,000 views on that video. And it's a, um, a video that doesn't have any language. I, I, I did the video with no sound because I knew that people in foreign countries would be watching it. They, they wouldn't be able to follow the language. Maybe. Oh, sure. So I did everything with no sound. So you can share it anywhere in the world. And, and people tell me all the time how, how well it works for them. Yeah, that's really smart. And I know uh, being a member of that Peacocks Only Facebook group, that's a common problem. And I know that you've helped a lot of birds with that video. Well, when you look on YouTube, it only says I've got about 1,700 views. But I got over 180,000 from just sharing it around Facebook to the different poultry groups. So we, we've had we've had right at 200,000 views of that. And in the Peacocks Only group, about 26% of our membership is from people in other countries. 
Really? And so I, I hope some have benefited from it that, that didn't speak the language. And, and they, they belong in some of the places I've never heard of. I, I've got to get a map and look them up. In, <laughs> in, in the most unusual places. And, uh, you know, uh, here's the thing that's uh, kind of sad and humorous at the same time. One time, you know, in Syria, they're out there killing everybody in the street every day. But one guy's calling me, asking me about his sick peacocks. You know, they love their oh. peacocks. But they're out there shooting right. each other every day. <laughs> I get them from Iran, from Agrat, Iraq, Baghdad, and every little island that'll make a dot in the ocean. And they just they just are all over this world, the peacocks are. Do you think that peacocks are more prevalent in other countries than they oh, are no. here in the U.S.? No, they're, they're most plentiful here in the U.S. and they're the cheapest here in the U.S. Um, oh, really? They're hard to find in other countries and and they're very expensive in uh if, you, if you're in a foreign country and you've got you three or four breeding pairs of peacocks, oh boy, you're sitting on a gold mine. Really? Yeah. One of those things we take for granted, I guess. Yeah. And there are several places here in the United States that people may not know about this. Palos Verde in California was the first one and they developed a feral flock, you know, back in the uh, 20s or 30s. Some guy, some old guy that had peacocks, he died in the farm, you know, fizzled out. The peacocks moved in the town built up around it. The peacocks are all over the town and they literally stop traffic in the road. Half the population is feeding them out the back door and the other half's trying to kill them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I even have a feral flock. There's not 7,000 people here in this little bitty town that I live in. There's a feral flock out here. A guy moved off, left really? his birds, moved to Canada, left his birds. He's lived in a wooded area. And so the neighbors tell me they, they'll feed them. Interesting. You can get feral, feral flocks of peacocks all over. You can't catch those guys because they're just way too smart for you. When once they get out there and they turn wild. So, do they breed pretty well in a feral flock? Are they generally able to um, raise enough chicks and stuff to to continue their their flock? Or because I know, like, you know, guinea fowl are terrible moms, and I don't even know how they exist to this day because they <laughs> they're so awful. But um, yeah. Are, are feral peafowl pretty good at raising up some young? I would think that it would depend on the part of the country. Now, down, I'm down here in southeast Texas near the coast, and our winters are generally pretty mild, but gosh, they got that snow and all up north. And so I don't know if they've got so many feral flocks up north. And people tell me all the time, yeah, well, well I got the flock in the woods. They do just fine. But here's the thing about a flock in the woods. They said they raise their chicks and they take care of them, but you never know how many eggs were left in the nest. You know, if they poke a hole in it, the next thing you know, the fire ants, they, they'll go through that hole into the egg. And then once the ants start coming to the nest, the mom takes two or three chicks and, and heads out with them. And if one of them has a foot or a leg problem, it gets left behind. I'm sure that they, they're able to sustain themselves, but they do a lot better if they were medicated. And they, would do, they would do better if they were fed better and, and sheltered better. Because they're, they're, they're victim to all kinds of predators, too. You know, you got coons, you got fox, you got owls, everything in the world, uh, d neighbors' dogs, and everything in mink, and everything comes after them. Sure. Well, I, I mean, easy pickings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, coming back around to um, when we raise our own chicks that uh, are hopefully without those issues, what do we? feed them. I, I know that that's always a challenge because you can't just go pick out some peach starter from your local feed store. Well, it, it's, a, it, it's a little simpler than people make it. If you ask uh, anybody on, on, on the Peacocks Only group, what are you feeding? If, you, if there's a hundred people post, there'll be a hundred different things. <laughs> yes. And I tell people, look, just buy some starter feed and later on buy some lay pellets. I said, it's just that simple. Everybody wants to make a science experiment out of feeding the peacock. What what do you have when you have a peacock? It's not, you got a chicken that's got a blue neck and a long tail. You know, it's just <laughs> like any other kind of bird. So you can't possibly know more than PhDs at Purina or one of the major feed mills. Can't possibly know more than them. And, and so they, well, I mix this and I mix that and I mix the other and they wound up with a whole bunch of stuff, a very unknown nutritional value, and that's what they feed their birds. So uh, just buy some chicken pellets. Gosh, you know, it's not complicated. I, I've been keeping these birds out here. It's a 46 years now. And uh, feeding chicken pellets all the time. 
But let me tell you about the starter, okay? You need a medicated starter, and different parts of the country has got different brands of medicated starter. Now, down here in the South, I can only get that medicated Purina, and it, it uh, protects them against coccidiosis. So if you've got a hen that brings some chicks in, you need to pick those chicks up as painful as it is to, to, to separate them from the mother because she'll complain a lot in, in the beginning. But you put those chicks in a, in a coop on wire off the ground and you feed them a medicated starter and you're going to do a lot better. And when you put those chicks back on the ground four months later, that mama will find them and she'll tag along with them. Now, if they're on the dirt in the wild or if they're hen raised, why do we need to put them up on the wire? Well, you know, I get asked that sometimes. People say, well, you know, out in the wild in India where they come from, you know, they're raised out there in the jungle. And I said, well, you don't have chickens out there in the jungle. You know, chickens are worm and germ factories. <laughs> they, they shed coccidiosis. They shed that uh, blackhead disease. They shed all kinds of worms. And they're resist more resistant to this kind of stuff. And when you pin birds is when you're going to have trouble. Even if you medicate them and you treat them, they'll, they'll get reinfected again. It's kind of like treating heartworms on a dog. You've got to keep that maintenance up for heartworms all year round because sure. they're so easily reinfected again. And, and see, birds in the wild are scattered out. They don't come in contact with, uh, with each other and contaminate each other so bad. In the chicken yard, it's usually full of uh, bacterial stuff, fungus, uh, worms, uh, everything else. So whereas it might be, I know some people would probably find it easier to let their hens just raise it. It sounds like there's a much higher success rate and uh, with taking them and feeding them this medicated feed and getting them up off the ground and whatnot. Yeah, it takes a, a peacock, it takes them 14 weeks to develop their resistance to blackhead and toxidiosis. And you just don't want to expose them to it before then. Sure. Because you, you're, you're not going to have good luck. So... Again, you know, if the birds are scattered out, uh, you're going to have less of a problem. But if you keep them in a confined space, and especially a pen, they're, they're going to chronically reinfect themselves all the time. And, and the chicks are going to pick it all up off the ground, pecking the ground. And, and especially if they peck poop, uh, they're going to pick up the coccidiosis and blackhead and, and worm eggs. And do you have any recommendations as far as this wire floored brooder is this something that you can make or is it something that you buy you know what what does that look like it, it kind of depends on what part of the country you're in now down here in the south i built a four by eight uh coop with a door on each end a four by eight and i put them in there and i put two heat lamps i hang one it, it's these shop lamps you buy them at walmart and hang one in each end and get a hundred watt flood lamp for each one because you want to have two lights in case one of them goes off and you know burns out oh, you sure. don't want your chicks exposed to cold temperature overnight but that lamp will keep them warm enough for me uh, but when you get further up north you, you're going to have to have uh, something you're going to have to build something uh that will maintain the, the temperature a little better but, but like i said I, I just put a sheet metal on the back i make it three foot tall and uh four by eight Put some sheet metal on the back and sheet metal on the roof and wire wire on the front, some doors on each end, and put the, the two drop lights in it, and you're good. Now, later on in the summer, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. This is important. A pea chick, more than any other chick, craves heat. I don't care if they're three months old and they're sitting under a shed, and yeah, they want that heat lamp. Now, if it gets during the day, it gets too warm, they'll move away from the light, until they find their comfort zone, they'll move away from it. And if you think it's really just too hot, you can always raise the height of the lamp up a little bit, or you can change the wattage on the bulb. But until they go on the ground, you've got to keep a heat lamp on. I have people that, that hatch chicks, and they'll say, well, you don't have these chicks, and they're dying. I said, okay, well, where are you keeping them? Oh, I got them in the house. All right, what's the temperature in the house? It's 75 degrees. You got a heat lamp? No. So okay, put some heat on them. And uh, this thing is not to bring them inside the house. When the heat lamp on, keep them out in a shed or a barn somewhere, you know, in the coop, and keep that heat lamp on. And you said keep the heat lamp on them until they're roughly four months old? Yeah, until you get ready to put them on the ground. What you do then is you, you change them to a grow-out pen. You've got a pen where they finish growing out. 
but you you feed them that medicated starter, uh, you know, all the way. You you can there you can feed that medicated starter the very year old if you want to, but not to have it the first four months. That's a, very important. And and notice when I say they build a resistance to blackhead and coccidiosis, it takes four months. I'm saying resistance because the immune system of the peacock is never going to be as good as the chicken. It's like a turkey. Um, turkeys, they don't have the strongest immune system in the world. I don't know. Have you ever tried to raise turkeys? I have two of them, actually. Do you have, do you have good luck with them? Well, they're the only two I've ever had, and I lost one um, as a chick. But these other two, I got lucky. I started out with three Narragansett poults, and I ended up with two toms and a hen, and one of the toms passed as a baby. I'm not really sure what happened, but I've had them about two years now, and they're they're doing great. They live with my peafowl and my pheasants, and everybody seems to get along pretty well, and, and they're doing well. Do you well. have chickens? I do, but they're in a separate pen. Oh, okay, good. Uh, because um, if you keep them away from chickens, you'll do you'll have better luck with them. Sounds like you're doing all right. But let me tell you something else about medication. Uh, you know they had what they call a federal vet directive. You know, I knew, yep. okay, well they're, they're pulling all the medications off the shelf. Yep, that's made it very challenging. Yeah, that control they had for blackhead and turkey feed. Uh, they started taking that out in the early '90s. So since that time, everybody's wondering. Well, my turkeys and my peacocks are all dying. Well, what the heck's the matter? So what it is is they're not putting that, there's, there's dimetrizol, metronidazole, and some other things you put in there in the feed, but uh, they, uh, they said there were, there, there's some real health concerns with that, and, and I agree with them. So, but when they when they came back with it, they defined poultry as chickens, guineas, geese, ducks, and turkeys. They didn't say anything about pigeons. So when you go to the pigeon sites, all the medication is there on the shelf. You can get whatever you want, but it's powders that you have to mix with water, and, and you have to catch your bird. If you got a sick one, you have to catch them when they're still drinking pretty good so they can drink up the medicated water, although there's a way to syringe it down their throat. It's hard for me to describe. You just kind of have to see a video on, on a picture. Mm -hmm. But you can still get medications if you, you go to the pigeon science. And there's a medication called all-in-one. Sometimes it's called five-in-one, and it will treat absolutely everything that's wrong with the bird. You can throw the worms, toxidiosis, and hexamidia, and um, canker. If you run into canker, it's, it's a growth that pigeons get in their throat and eventually it grows and, and it chokes them. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you ever had that? Um, ironically, no, but when I was uh, younger, I used to volunteer at a raptor center, so a rehabil uh, rehabilitation facility for injured birds of prey. And uh, we would often get birds in with trichomoniasis, which yeah, I, which is just kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, peacocks don't get that often, but they do get it, and it, it shows up as a, sometimes a whitish and pale yellow growth in the throat. It's easy to see, but you you give them that medication for five days, you give them that metronidazole will knock it out those tablets. You give them that medication for five days, and it's going to take care of it. But so I ask people sometimes, have you got any pigeons? And they say, well, you know. You feed the birds and everything comes in here to eat with them. And I think, I think the doves, and they'd be picking it up from doves if they don't have wild pigeons or keeping pigeons. It's very common with pigeons. Mm -hmm. So with our chicks, when can we tell what their gender is? You know, everybody, of course, wants to know. And I always see these pictures. Do you think it's a male or female? And there's all kinds of speculation. But when can we know for sure? And what are some of the things that we should look for? This is one of those things where a picture is better than a thousand words, but let, let me tell you, um, some of your listeners may not know this, but a lot of people don't realize it, but there's 125 different colors and color patterns of peacocks. Some of them are just not easy to tell. Now, a lot of people want to send their whites in and get some DNA testing for about 13 bucks, but you don't have to do that. You let that chick get up about three months old, and uh, a male's tail it's eventually going to grow a long tail. So at about three months old, you'll see his tail is going to be more pointed and spiked and, and a little longer. And a hen's tail, which is going to be shorter, it's going to be more rounded. So if you got one that looks spiked and it's growing out longer tails, that's a male, and otherwise it's a hen. And if you're looking at uh, most of the other colors, they'll have bars on the wing. And at about two to three months, the hens will start losing the bars on the wings and, and the males won't. 
And that's the best way to tell where I'm going. And if somebody's unsure, I assume that they can post pictures on the group and, and people will be there to help them. Post a photo and somebody's got that cone and they'll tell you. you know? Okay, great. The, the ones that are a little hard for me to sort out are the spaldings. Uh, there's a job of green that you can mix with any of those 125 colors and you come out with a hybrid bird. I don't like those hybrids, those spaldings, and I'll tell you why. I don't like the job of greens either. I've never kept them. A job of green is a spooky wild bird and uh, it's mean. To, to the other really? birds and to the keepers, yeah. So I, I, I never wanted to mess with it. And when you breed it to like an India blue, you'll come out with a, a spawning. And the thing about uh, spawnings are you may get a really good looking bird, but they don't breed true. That offspring that you get when you breed those, they'll come out some, some other pattern of color. So they, they don't breed true and they're mean and, and even even the hybrids uh, often do kind of spooky and flighty. And, Interesting. But, uh, I, I, I have a hard time sorting those spaldings out when they're young. And so I, I if somebody asks about it, I, I just, I'll let other people answer those questions that know how to do it. Because I've never even seen a java green, nor have I seen the spaulding except for photos. And uh, it just, it's just a little hard to sort out, especially if you've never seen one. Sure. So this might be, you know, kind of a lot of information for people that are just starting to to do their research about incubating uh, peafowl eggs, but do you have any other last minute takeaways or any other tips for those that might want to get started? Well, yes, I do. You remember we said that the best way to hatch peacock eggs is with a turkey or chicken. Now, you may you mm-hmm. may be wondering, well, why are we not hatching them with the peacock hen? They are just not reliable sitters. They'll okay. sit on that nest for two weeks and then they'll get up and go. Or more likely, they won't sit on it at all. So you're better off with a chicken or a turkey or an incubator is going to be your, your third choice. And we said, you know, that's, uh, there's some problems uh, with incubators. They don't, the hatch rate is often not uh, what you want it to be in an incubator. But, you know, if you don't have anything else, that's what we use. So I want to tell you about the incubator placement. Where you put the incubator is very important. If you put it in a barn or an open shed or a shop or somewhere outside, where a room or a space where the humidity and the temperature is going to fluctuate, you're going to have trouble because you're going to have the the humidity and the temperature fluctuate in the incubator also. So you need to keep them in a place, preferably uh, not more 80 degrees or under. Now, when I say under, I don't mean way under because if you've got it out somewhere where it's 30 degrees, your incubator may not be able to keep the heat up. You know, it may not be able to keep it up. So anything between about, you know, 60 and 80 degrees is real good. But that uh, it's especially important to consider the humidity because when you set the humidity on the incubator, that that uh, that humidity in the ambient space, the space outside the incubator, if that humidity is going up and down, it's going to go up and down inside the incubator too. So you want a room where the humidity and the temperature are going to be stable between about 60 and 80 degrees, and uh, then you set your incubator. Now, let me tell you about why you don't want it more than 80 degrees. Once that incubator reaches 90 degrees, I wish I had a more technical explanation for you, but it is simply not going to function properly, and it's not going to hatch any of the eggs, whatever you put into it. So you've you got to keep that uh, ambient temperature down. Okay. And you've got to candle the eggs at 10 days, you take a flashlight. If you get one of these small mag lights, they work the best with mag lights about three or four inches long. You turn the lights out, put the put the uh, light uh, under the egg, and if there's something growing in there, then you know you're okay. And if it's clear and all you can see is the yolk, well, you need to discard that one after 10 days because it's not fertile. Mm-hmm. But, but let me tell you, may I add one, one more thing? Sure. Uh, a, a lot of people are reporting good success. Those people are just hatching a few eggs, like uh, 12 to 20 eggs. Uh, a lot of people are reporting really good ses- success with the, the Nurture 360 that you can get from Amazon or Tractor Supply. It, it, it seems to be doing a really good job uh, on a small scale for, for people who are hatching eggs and they don't have the hand to sell. And you said that was the Nurture 360? Nurture 360. It's $149. Okay. And I think it may be $10 more on Amazon because, you know, they have to add their free shipping. 
Of course. Well, so, being an Amazon seller, I can also say that Amazon charges a ton of fees. So, yeah, but yeah. I digress. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll put a link to that incubator so that people can uh, can find it too. Yeah, yeah. Now you have to modify it to uh, to take uh, larger eggs. But if you join the Peacock Summit Group, you ask somebody, "How do I modify my Nurture 360?" And there'll be ten people show you a photo. Okay, great. And so obviously, if listeners hadn't heard yet, the Peacocks Only group is your group and you're on there as Douglas Buffington and you're an amazing right. resource. And so okay. if anybody has PFAL, definitely check out that Facebook group and I'll put a link to that as well. But yeah, I know that you've saved my birds on multiple occasions and I've seen you save other birds and I can't even begin to express to you how grateful I am for your group and for your help. Well, you know, that's like music to my ears. Uh, I, because that's my mission is to help people be successful with their birds. Ha, have you ever accessed the file section of the group? I have. Oh, oh everything you could possibly want to know about a peacock is posted there. It's yes. a great source of information. It, it, it is very difficult to find on, on the internet if you can find it at all. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing about peacock information, those poultry groups, there's just a lot of bad information that floats around. And we got the straight dope. You want the straight dope, you access our file section. There's 60 pages there to tell you anything you want to know about people. Yep, absolutely. Uh, everything from how to give your birds medication to how to deworm them to identifying and treating illnesses. I mean, it's really a, an amazing resource. People tell me I need to write a book, and I tell them I've already wrote a book. You just, you just have to copy one. <laughs> One page at a time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and some people tell me they have downloaded it. They keep it in a, in, a, uh, in the plastic inserts in a notebook. Sure. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, Douglas, I really appreciate your time and sharing, you know, some more knowledge about PFAL with us. Again, if if you have listened to this episode and you found it interesting, please check out the other episode that Douglas and I recorded together. And hopefully we can plan some more episodes in the future. And, and Douglas, thank you again for your time today. It would be wonderful to talk to you. And uh, I hope all those people out there are thinking about PFAL and getting encouraged to get some. Absolutely. And for those of you listening, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty, a podcast by HeritageAcresMarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at HeritageAcresMarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.